Can everybody hear me okay? All right, Joe, if you would, go turn it up. It's, the, it's number one. If you open that door, it's all the way on the left, and it's the number one down at the bottom. You got to slide it up now instead of down. It might be childproof. Y'all wait. <laughs> Testing, one, two. Is that any better? Can y'all hear me in the back okay? Okay, I can hear it now. Okay, thank you, Joe. I was just kidding about the childproof. Good morning. Glad to see everybody here today. Did you turn it on, Cole? Good deal. All right, I appreciate it. Cole's running the camera for me, so I appreciate that. Got a few announcements this morning. Uh, not a whole lot, but got a few. Just make sure you get a copy of the bulletin. There's quite a few dates in there and things that are going on. Also, some updates on some other things. Uh, if you remember from Wednesday night, if you happen to hear teachers, if you were in charge of a classroom, either on Sunday, Sunday morning or Wednesday night, if you could go in the classroom sometime between now and Wednesday, we didn't announce it last Wednesday, but between now and this Wednesday, and just kind of put everything away, we're going to have somebody come in and clean the carpets and sanitize everything. So it's much stuff that's on the table or if you need to throw stuff away, there's two cans out there that we're not using right now very much at all that could use some trash in them. So if you need to go through and clean some stuff out and throw some stuff away, by all means, it's a good time to do it. But we just want to try to get those rooms as clutter free as possible so we can get everything in there kind of cleaned off for whenever we are able to start back and still not sure when that's going to be yet. Also, uh, congratulate Dina, I like to embarrass her, and Jason. Jason's not here this morning. Uh, they were baptized Tuesday night and have been here with us for several weeks, maybe six, eight weeks visiting with us, and they plan to be here with us, so congratulate them also on their decision for that. That is all the announcements that I have. If somebody has an announcement they need me to make, get here early and have it written down. So let's bow together and have a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful, dear Lord, that we can be here today, that we can come together and worship you and remember what your son's done for us, dear Lord, and sing songs of praise to you and give of our means, dear Lord. We're thankful for the opportunity to do this and that we are able to be here. Help us all to stay safe and stay well. Help us to do the things that we can reasonably do to keep ourselves safe, but to realize that you are still in control. There will still be summer and winter harvest and seed time, dear Lord. We know that things will continue on Help us to do the best we can to cope with what's going on, but to still do the best we can as a Christian, dear Lord. Please forgive us of our sins. Please be with the many that have had the virus, especially those in our congregation that have had it and that are trying to get over it, dear Lord. And we're thankful for all those who have gotten better. Please forgive us and bless us, dear Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is about 15 verses. Sometimes I have to do that to kind of make it I hate to leave four verses at the end of a chapter and not read them, so we kind of did that this morning, and uh, we'll finish this chapter out. Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 45, so if you remember, which um, Sunday's a long time, last week we read Jesus had went into the garden to pray and had asked his apostles to stay out there and watch for him and wait, and so we pick up actually verse 45. So Jesus uh, is coming back to him. When he arose from his prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the captains in the temple, and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and with clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour, the power of darkness. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house, but Peter followed at a distance. 
Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow was also with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, I will deny you three, that you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. And Scott, I read two verses too many, so if you want to start in 63. Our first song this morning is Here We Are with Strange Pilgrims. You have a book, it's 247. And we'll sing all three verses. Here we are, the strain pilgrims here, a path is often dim, but to cheer us on our journey still, we sing this wayside hymn, yonder on the rolling river bend, the shining mansion's rise, soon will be our home forever, and the smile of the blessed Oh, 
there anyone who needs their communion cups? If you do, raise your hand and we'll get you one. Okay. It's this time that we gather around the Lord's table to remember his death on the cross. <coughs> Jesus commands us this do in remembrance of him. This time we need to take our minds away from our worldly thoughts, take it back to the cross, remember that great sacrifice. We had the bread representing his broken body, the fruit of the vine representing his spilled blood on that cross. Before we take of the bread, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we do indeed thank you, Father, for that great blessing that we have that Jesus went to that cross and died for our sins. Father, we pray that as we take of this bread that remember his broken body upon that cross, we do so in a manner that is meaningful to us, well-pleasing in thy sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Likewise, Father, the cup, as we partake of this cup that represents the spilled blood on that cross. Father, we pray that we do so in a well-pleasing manner. We pray, Father, that we do take our minds back to that cross and remember that great sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. We now have the opportunity to obey another command, that is to lay by and store. Before we had the opportunity to give back as we've been prospered, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we prepare to give back to you a portion of that which you have so richly blessed us with, Father, we pray that we examine ourselves and we realize the blessings that we have. Father, we just pray that we give in a, in a well-pleasing manner and, and a loving heart and giving heart. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll be picking up where Paul left off. <clears throat> Luke chapter 22, verse 63 through 
71. Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. And having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. As soon as it was day, the elders of the, of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer. Answer me, or let me go. Hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you the Son of God? And he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in prayer this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to be here, Father. We pray for the ones who are not here, Father, for uh, physical or spiritual reasons, Father. We ask you for something that we can do to help them be here at the next point in time that we may be able to do that or something we may be able to say, Father. Uh, we pray for the ones around us uh, affected by the virus. We ask it be your will to help them get over safely, that we may be able to get back to worship as Bob, as you say so, Father, that we may be able to be meeting three, day, three times a week and just to further your kingdom. Father, we ask you to be with us as we continue through the service, help do things in, a, in the right manner, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you do have a book and you'd like to mark the invitation song, it would be number 31 in your book, Almost Persuaded. Before the lesson, we'll sing joyful, joyfully and lordly. Let's stand as we sing this song. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. see everyone here this morning. Uh, of course, we still uh, are longing to have this, this place packed, uh, but certainly thankful to everyone uh, that is here today. Appreciate Brother Reg uh, leading our singing. Did a great job Wednesday night and did a great job this morning. Appreciate everyone who's participated so far and looking forward to this study with you. Last week, we began a study of the theme, the end of time. And we began by asking the question, is this the end of time? A lot of people are looking to what's going on in 2020 and they've said, well, all these uh, things that are going on, these are signs pointing to the second coming of Christ. But we took the time to dive into Matthew chapter 24 uh, to notice that there were multiple questions being asked. There were multiple questions being answered. We talked about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. But then we talked about the day of the Lord and Jesus said of that day and hour, no one knows, Matthew 24, 36. 
But now we continue our study of this theme, and we ask the question, where do we go when we die? I don't know about you, but this is a question that really stops me in my tracks and makes me think. Because we all know how fragile life can be. We're here one moment, we're gone the next. James says our life is but a vapor. And so as we think about this question, I hope that you'll blot out worldly thoughts, whatever you have going on, and let's really think about this topic so we can go to the Word of God and find the truth on it, and hopefully it will help us to have a better understanding. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to Luke 16, as we're going to focus on verses 19 through 31 in just a moment. But as we begin, by means of introduction, I want to ask this question. What is death? That's a loaded question, isn't it? What is death? I have a few thoughts I want to share with you. First, death is something we all face. It's something we all face. In Psalm 90 and verse 10, it reads that our lives are 70 years, if by strength, 80 years, and then we fly away. So teach us to apply our hearts to wisdom and to number our days. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, it says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And so death is something uh, that we all face. If you will, it's a reality of life. That's death. But also, as we think about the definition of death, death is defined as when the soul separates from the body. What we have right here is an earthly tabernacle, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 and following. This is just temporary. This is not an eternal body. This is something that we have, but we have a soul within us because we are all made in the image of God. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. But the Bible sheds light on this when the soul separates from the body. You may recall in Genesis chapter 35 and verse 18 that Rebekah struggled in childbirth and she died. And it said, as her soul was in departing, for she died. And so again, the Bible describes death as when the soul leaves the body. We find that in James 2.26 as well. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And so when the soul leaves this earthly body, death takes place. But then what happens? The Bible teaches that the spirit returns to God who gave it. We find that God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, Genesis 2, seven. But what did he make man? From what did he make man? The dust of the earth. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, Man will return to the dust, but the Spirit will return to God who gave it. We find in Hebrews 12, 9 that God is the Father of spirits. And so again, the Spirit goes back to Him. But then a final point before we move on is that death is the great equalizer. Death has no respect for persons. Young, old, black, white, rich, poor, it doesn't matter. Death is no respecter of persons. So with these thoughts in mind, Maybe we'll have a better understanding of death, a better appreciation for it, if you will, knowing that it's something that we all face. But now we ask the question that's the title of this sermon. Where do we go when we die? You know, there are a lot of different views on this. And this past week in studying this, I was amazed of how many things that are said. Some say that when you die, it's like flipping off a light switch. You cease to exist. Others say you can go to this place, and if your loved ones pay enough money, you can get out of that awful place. I won't take time to mention the name of that group. There are also some who say that if you uh, pass into the next life, if you lived a pretty good life, you'll be reincarnated and come back as an animal. And depending on how good you are, that depends on what kind of animal you're going to be. And so, friends, there are a lot of uh, different ideas about it, but we're only interested in what the Bible says. We're only re- interested in what God has to say about it. And the Bible teaches that our souls depart to Hades. Our souls depart to the Hadean realm. Brother Reg and I were, were kind of joking about this. He said, you ought to get up and say, we're all going to Hades. But you know what? That's true. We are all going to the Hadean realm. It just depends on which place you're going. And we're going to notice from our text in a few moments the two places involved. But this word Hades means that which is unseen. And so the Hadean realm is, in fact, the, the realm of the unseen. The way Brittany and I have tried to describe it to Jackson is when you die, you go to a waiting room. A waiting room for disembodied spirits. And that's really the idea behind the Hadean realm. You're going to await the judgment. Unfortunately, this word Hades has been uh, misapplied. It's been misused in some translations. I want to share a few examples with you. Because when we hear you're going to Hades, what, do we equi- what is that equivalent to in our minds? Well, hell. 
because we can look in the Bible and see some passages. I want to share a few. First, we think about Psalm 16 and verse 10. This is a messianic psalm. What that means is it's pointing to the Messiah. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol. That word Sheol in the Hebrew language is the same and the equivalent, if you will, of Hades. And so not leave your soul in Sheol, nor you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You say, well, how do you know this is messianic? Because the Bible's its own best commentary. And Peter quoted from this, Acts 2 and verse 31. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. There are some who teach that when Jesus died, he went to hell and spent three days in hell. But that's not what the Bible teaches. That's misapplying this word. Jesus died and went to Hades. He went to the Hadean realm. But where did he go? Well, the Bible teaches he went to paradise. And that's what we're going to notice as we continue on as well. But, but here's another passage that has been misused. That's Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Some have said, Oh, the gates of hell is not going to prevail against it. But what is being said is not even death itself was going to prevent the kingdom from being established. And we read in Acts chapter 2 that it was. And so we've noticed so far that death is when the soul separates from the body and our souls depart to the Hadean realm. But now you may be asking, well, what's involved in the Hadean realm? What are the places that we read about? And to that we must go to what has been revealed in the Word of God. And that's Luke 16, 19 through 31. There are arguments for and against this being a parable. And it may be the case that you read this and you come to the conclusion that this is a parable. Or perhaps you read this and say this was an actual event, this is not a parable. If you would like to study that further for your own personal study, please come see me afterwards. I've got a lot of material I'll be happy to share with you. But for our purposes this morning, we're not going to spend the time on whether or not this is a parable. We just want to look at the content. And so with that being said, we're going to look at this uh, very unique, very amazing piece of literature only recorded by Luke. And we want to walk through this text together. And so in the first place, let's notice in verses 19 through 21, the people involved. Jesus is speaking and he says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Here we see there are two individuals that are mentioned. The rich man. Notice how he's described. Clothed in purple. Uh, purple, of course, is that color of majesty. And you think about back in those times, it would have been very costly. If you saw someone in purple, you associated that with someone being very rich. Fared sumptuously. We don't use that word sumptuously very often. But that means that he lived in luxury. I've heard Brother Paul say this in prayers, and he's exactly right. We as Americans fare sumptuously every day especially compared to other parts of the world. And so in many ways, we're like this. We live a life of luxury, if you think about it, of all the blessings that God has given us in this country. But then we read about Lazarus. Notice how he's described. A beggar, full of sores. He desired to eat just the crumbs on the rich man's table. And then it says that he was among the dogs who licked his sores. Commentators have different ideas. It may be that they licked his sores and that's the only kind of comfort that he had. Or it may be the case that they were all fighting for, for crumbs. And so they were licking him trying to get to those crumbs. Re regardless of that, though, we have two different situations, don't we? And if someone were to ask you, which one would you like to be, what would you say? Would you rather be the rich man who had everything that he wanted or this beggar who's begging for, for just some crumbs? So we have the people involved to set the stage for our study. But now let's notice the places described, beginning in verse 22, going down to verse 23. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. We want to think about where Lazarus went, and then we want to focus on where the rich man went. But before that, I want you to think about something with me. I wonder how lavish and how all the pomp and circumstance that was around the rich man's funeral. I wonder if he had hired mourners. I wonder if he had musicians, maybe. 
Maybe this illustrious casket if they had those back then. Think about uh, all this procession going to his grave. But then the beggar, I wonder if anybody attended his funeral. But you see, death being the great equalizer, those roles were reversed, weren't they? It didn't matter. And what a lesson we need to hear today. When you die, you don't take any of it with you. There's not a U-Haul following you to the, <laughs> to the funeral home, That's what my teachers used to say. Here we see the places described of where these individuals went. What they did in life, what they had in life, that doesn't matter. All that matters is where their soul is going. Lazarus, notice, was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The word bosom means a place of blessedness or a place of honor. We read in John 1 and verse 18 that the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, was in the bosom of the Father. What's that mean? A place of blessedness, a place of honor. You may recall in John 13, 23, John, the apostle whom Jesus loved, leaning up on his bosom to ask him who it was that was going to betray him. And so again, that word means to be exalted to a place of blessedness or honor. And that's what we have with Lazarus. And so he went in the place in the Hadean realm where the righteous go to await judgment. I mentioned earlier that he went to paradise. When Jesus was speaking to the thief on the cross, he said, Today you will be with me in paradise. So that's where Jesus went. That's where that thief went. And that's where the righteous go to await the judgment. Luke 23, 43. But now let's look at the other side of this, where the rich man went. The rich man died and was buried. I think that language is fascinating. When the beggar died, what did he see? What happened? He opened his eyes in death, if you will, to have angels coming to carry him away. But what about this rich man who had all these great things in this life? It just says he died and he was buried. That's it. He died and he was buried and being in torments in Hades. The word torments means a supernatural realm and it's known for its darkness and for its emptiness. And the word torment in the Greek language is the word tartarus. And it's only found one time in our New Testament. And that's 2 Peter 2 and verse 4. I'll make sure it's up there for you. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. Notice this language. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell. Again, the word there is Tartarus, not Gehenna. And delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Doesn't that describe what we've been talking about? This place that you go, a waiting room, reserved for judgment. That's what Tartarus says. It's a place called torment. And it comes from a, Greek, a word in Greek mythology where the wicked were kept and where the wicked were punished. And so to this Hellenistic ear, that would have made a lot of sense. They would have known automatically what that's being uh, referred to. And so we see the people who were involved, the rich man and Lazarus, we see that they die and the roles are reversed. We see that Lazarus was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, a place called Paradise. But the rich man died and went to a place called Torment. Both are in the Hadean realm, but there are two totally different locations where they are. Let's continue in this text and notice the plea that is made. The plea that is made. And you'll notice that there are two pleas that the rich man cries out to give Abraham. First we find it in verse 24, and then we notice it in 27 and 28. Then he, the rich man, cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. It kind of destroys the doctrine to say that you die and then it shuts off. He was in this state, wasn't he? He was being tormented. I find it interesting also that he says, send Lazarus. He still viewed Lazarus as that beggar. He still viewed Lazarus as a servant. But oh, how, how, the, how the ties were turned. Lazarus is in paradise. And here's the rich man coming to the realization that he's in this place of torment. And all he wants is just a moment of relief. And brethren, I want you to appreciate something with me. The rich man's still there. How long ago was this? If this is an actual event. A couple thousand years? He's still there longing for a moment of relief and he's never going to find it. What a sobering thought. I hope you'll think about that with me. I am tormented in this flame. He's crying out to Abraham. Let's notice the next plea, verses 27 and 28. I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, 
that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. First he asked for himself, but when he realized there was no way he was leaving, he said, well, I have five brothers, and I'm afraid they're coming where I'm at. Please send Lazarus, because if they see one risen from the dead, surely they'll repent. But now we want to see what Abraham had to say, the pronouncement that was given as we come to our final point in the text. This is verses 25, 26, as well as 29 through 31. Notice to the first plea, the first question. Send Lazarus that he may drop some water on my tongue that I may have some relief. Verse 25. Abraham said, Son, remember. Underline or highlight that word remember. Very important. Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now... He is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, even if that were possible, listen to what Abraham says. Besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Again, we see that the roles were reversed. Lazarus is now comforted, the rich man being tormented. But this phrase, the great gulf fixed, what does that mean? It means when you die, your fate is sealed. When you draw your last breath in this life and you slip into eternity, there's no more opportunities to respond to the Lord's invitation. There's no more opportunities to obey the gospel. There's no more opportunities to pray to God to forgive you. That's it. It's too late. And here we see that the rich man, no matter how loud he begged, no matter how many times he cried for mercy, it wasn't coming. He had his opportunities, and he missed them. And so we have this pronouncement that is given. Let's go to the second pronouncement, verses 29 through 31. This is in response to the question, I have five brothers. Can you please send him to them? Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. It's very powerful that Abraham referred to Moses and the prophets here. Some would say, well, if he had the evidence, surely he would repent and get his life right. Maybe we hear that language today. If only he had this evidence, I believe he would change his life and change his ways. Dear friends, we have all the evidence we need right here in the Word of God. All of it. There's no excuse for anyone to have a lack of faith in God. It's all been provided right here. We have all the evidence that we need. And so Abraham refers to Moses and the prophets. Now what was still in effect during this time? Jesus was still alive. The old law was still in effect. They have Moses and the prophets. If they want to be right with God, whatever dispensation you're under, you have to do what God says in that time. What dispensation are we in today? The Christian dispensation, the Christian age. Who are we to listen to? Jesus, the one who has all authority, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The one whose words will judge us in the last day, John 12, 48. But here he says they have Moses and the prophets. They have all the evidence that they need. And so, brethren, the problem wasn't with a lack of evidence, but a lack of willingness to submit to what God has revealed. And the same is true today. People are lost and stay lost because they're not willing to submit. Now, if someone's good and honest and they have a good and honest heart and they're presented with the truth, what will they do? They'll respond. And we have a job before us, Christians. We have a job to get the word out and evangelize like never before. Because so many are slipping into eternity in a lost state. As we think about this old law, Moses and the prophets, I'd like for you to leave this text with me and go with me to Luke 24 for just a moment as we start to bring everything to a close. Luke chapter 24, I believe this is an important point to emphasize uh, from this text. Here we have Jesus speaking of Moses and the prophets and why they were important. You may recall this is uh, in context of the two on the road to Emmaus. And they didn't realize that Jesus was right beside them. Picking up in verse 25 of Luke 24. O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? 
And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Did you know that there's some in the religious world that say there's nothing in the Old Testament that points to Christ? Jesus begs to differ, doesn't he? Jesus said that the things written in Moses and the prophets pointed to him. They had the evidence provided. They were just not willing to submit. One other passage in verses 44 and 45 of Luke 24. Jesus said, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. So what's the purpose of the old law? What's the purpose of Moses and the prophets? To point to Jesus. We find this in Galatians 3.24. The law was a schoolmaster or a tutor to bring us to Christ. But now that the faith has come, we no longer need a schoolmaster. We no longer need a tutor. We can all be one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.26 and 27. By putting him on in baptism. But then in 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul writing to Timothy. He said, from a child, you have known the holy scriptures. What scriptures were those? The Old Testament scriptures, the prophetic word. You have known these that can make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And so that's why Abraham emphasized this twice to the rich man. He told him, you're where you are because you failed to respond to what God has revealed. And the same is true for everyone who's in that location. But a sobering thought is that if we don't take it to people who are lost, we'll be lost too. A great responsibility we have as Christians. Again, this is an amazing text that we have in Scripture. It's unlike anything that we have in any kind of literature in the world. It gives us a glimpse into the afterlife. It's Jesus, if you will, pulling back the curtain so we can look through the eye of faith and see what happens when we die. But I want to share several points of application with you. First, just a reminder that death is the great equalizer. We saw the rich man, we saw Lazarus, but when they died, their roles were reversed. It does not matter how much money is in your bank account. It doesn't matter what kind of car you drive, what kind of clothes you wear. All that matters is if your heart and your soul is right with God. That's it. When you die, that's all that matters. And that's what this teaches us. We've learned today that when we die, our souls enter the Hadean realm where we either go to a place called paradise or a place called torment to await the judgment. John 5, 28 and 29. Another lesson is that we maintain our consciousness. We maintain our memory. Abraham's son said, son, remember. The rich man was able to remember all the good things he had in life. He was able to remember his five brothers who were lost. How sad, how horrifying to slip into eternity and to remember that you had an opportunity to get your life right with God and you didn't take it. A second after death, you will know where you're going to spend eternity. To wake up in a place called torment, being tormented in a flame, only to realize that there's no escape, no way out. You're there. Your fate is sealed. That's a sobering thought. I debated on whether or not to put this one in here, but I think this is something we need to hear. Those who are in torment now even loved ones and friends, let me say that again, even loved ones and friends, they do not want you to join them. I can't tell you how many times I study the Bible with someone and they say, I know what you're showing me is true, I believe that, but that's not what my mom and dad did. That's not what my grandparents did and I'm not going to go against them. If I do what's right here, I'm going to condemn them. Listen, what you do doesn't change where they spend eternity. If they've already passed from this life, their fate is sealed as we've studied today. Nothing you do is going to change that. So what does that matter for us? All that matters is you make sure you get yourself to heaven. Because if you miss heaven, what will it matter? If you lose your soul, what will it matter? We have to remember that on the day of judgment, every one of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Romans 14, 12. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things done in this body, whether it be good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5.10. I can't stand in your place. You can't stand in mine. I certainly can't stand for my loved ones who have gone on and they died in a lost state. I can't change that. And you can't either. 
All that matters is where we're going to spend eternity. And what matters is those who are still living. Loved ones and friends that we know are lost. Have we talked to them about Jesus? Have we talked to them about their souls? God has given us things, all things, in fact, pertaining to life and godliness. 2 Peter 1.3 He's provided ample evidence, more than enough evidence, that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we might have life through His name. John 20, 30, and 31. But then a final point of application is that one day it will be too late to respond to the Lord's invitation. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. That invitation is extended today. But one day, the door of opportunity will be shut. Matthew 25, 10. We find in Revelation 3, 20, Jesus saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Will we open the door? Or will we keep it shut? We find in Revelation twenty two seventeen, 17, Whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever is a thirst, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. But will you come? We're going to sing in just a moment the song Almost Persuaded. And dear friend, to be almost persuaded is to be completely lost. Imagine slipping into eternity and hearing the lyrics to Almost Persuaded on repeat forever. Knowing you had the time, you had the opportunity to get your life right on this day and you didn't take it. Who's to say we're going to live to see tomorrow? We don't know. We don't know. We do know that God has given us a wonderful opportunity today to be here. And if your, heart, if your life is not right with God, don't waste this opportunity. We've noticed today that you can die. In fact, we're going to. We're going to face it. Unless the Lord comes back first, we're all going to face it. Where will you spend eternity? Are you ready to slip into eternity? If you were to die tonight and wake up your eyes, would you see Lazarus? Would you see the faithful in Abraham's bosom? Or would you wake up your eyes to see the rich man still crying out and you joining him? If you're not a Christian, don't waste this opportunity. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, if you're willing to repent of your sins, you're willing to change your life, if you're willing to confess with a mouth that Jesus is Lord, you can be baptized, immersed in water, have your sins washed away by the blood of a lamb, and rise to walk in newness of life. But it may be the case that you are a Christian, but you realize you have sin in your life. You realize you haven't been faithful. And if you die tonight, you'll die and meet the rich man in torments. Don't let that be you. Don't waste this opportunity. Don't be almost persuaded. Be fully persuaded. Won't you come? As together we stand and as we sing.
Thank you so much for being here this morning. If you have any questions or if you're just not sure, please come see me. I would love to study with you. It's something that's too important. Eternity is too long to be wrong. And we want to make sure that our hearts are right with God. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we're going to continue this study and we're going to look at the judgment day. I was joking with Brother Paul. I said originally I had both of these in this sermon and I realized there's no way I could do that. But next week we're going to do a play-by-play, -play, if you will, coming from a sports guy, a play-by-play -play of the judgment day and see what's going to happen on that day. What are we going to see? What are we going to hear? What's going to happen? And so I hope you'll be here next week. Invite somebody to come with you. I know that this is a strange time, uh, but we're doing everything. The elders are, are doing a great job making sure we can still meet and try to keep social distancing. So uh, please do that. And then Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, don't forget, we'll be 